um, like I mentioned, in another time, so that is half a good. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I was here last month uh, to talk to many of you about this already. Um, I'm Dan Cunningham, I head up the people of the core of developers. Uh, and our global movement, Hack for Good, uh, so we're uniting the world's top developers, entrepreneurs, software engineers, product designers, um, globally to come together and hack against climate change. Um, this was actually the map last month when I was here. I think we had 27 cities confirmed and many more on the target list. Um, we've now got 42 cities confirmed. So uh, this will be the biggest hack ever mobilized globally against climate change. Um, and we really aim to have a, a, a huge dramatic impact on uh, many of the issues related to climate change. Um, we're going to be uniting over 3,000 developers globally. Um, we've, you know, Geekless Hack for Good, we've done several global hackathons before. Um, and the model really is about um, bringing on the right partners and NGOs, so like Fallen Floor International in this case, um, and a few others we'll work with, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so bringing them on to really pose what are the big challenges, what are the big problems, um, where should we as uh, technologists who have the power to uh, create innovation in the world, where should we be focusing our efforts to um, actually unite uh, as humanity and solve some of these issues. Uh, and the issues that we're talking about and addressing uh, with this hackathon um, range from everything from public awareness, so making sure that um, people, politicians, um, you know, everyone involved is, is really aware of the, the science and understanding of the impacts um, of their activities <coughs> and of climate change, the, the, the impacts they're having on, on the environment uh, and what's to come. Um, and then the adaptation side is about um, how can we actually deal with the impacts that we know are coming and that are present today. Um, so this is looking at all the humanitarian um, efforts that are going on. Um, how do we build more resilient communities? How do we respond to extreme weather events? How do we respond to drought? Uh, agricultural challenges uh, and ecosystems in the um, and then on the action side, it's actually uh, how do we go about reducing our emissions? Um, how do we produce energy more effectively, uh, lower carbon forms of energy, and how do, we, how do we transition to a low carbon society? Um, so these are all really big challenges, um, and that's why you know, it takes mobilizing the biggest hackathon that's ever been against climate change to uh, hopefully start solving some of them. Uh, these are the partners that we're working with so far, or some of them at least, um, to a number of global NGOs and campaigning organizations, um, some of whom I don't think we normally work together, so it's amazing to be bringing all of them together, and uh, if you're part of this hackathon, you'll have a chance to work with them to really understand the challenges that they're addressing and how we can play a part in, uh, in helping solve them. Um, of course, it's not just about what happens with the hackathon, so uh, many people are quite cynical of hackathons and, and kind of often the outcomes are, you know, something pretty cool is built, but it doesn't actually go forwards. Um, so that's why for us it's really important, you know, to partner with these organisations who can actually take forward those projects through initiatives like Conservation Labs. Um, and, and also to, to really position these uh, projects <coughs> Um, in front of uh, investors, social incubator, social impact incubator programs, uh, technology accelerator programs, um, and all those different ways that someone can take forward one of these projects. Uh, so from previous hackathons, we've had teams going on to be contracted by an NGO to keep working and field testing the project. Uh, we've had another team in London who went on to Bethnal Green Ventures and formed a, a social enterprise. Um, We've had other teams uh, across India get seed funding from just individual investors. And um, so, you know, these are all ways that we can continue forward the project, which is what this is all about. Um, and we need your help. Um, so this is just under six weeks away. 
Um, I think this is the last thing we're before. Yes, so it's my last chance now. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've got a, a global network of volunteers mobilized in all these cities I've spoken about. Um, we've got all of those NGOs and challenge partners on board. Um, our challenge over the next six weeks is to work with them um, to really properly define what are the challenges and problems they face. We've started to get some of those in, but um, I really am asking for your help uh, to help define those in the right way such that they're appropriate for a hackathon, such that you know, data sets are uh, identified and cleaned up and ready to use, um, so that when it comes to the hackathon weekend, you know, we can hit the ground running and uh, really produce some incredible prototypes to address some of these challenges, uh, things that can have a real impact uh, going forwards, and especially uh, this year and next year, which are critical years for climate change with international negotiations and so on. So, um, sign up is now open at hackforgood.io. So, please go and sign up. Um, when you sign up, you can tick some boxes to say that you'd like to help uh, in London or help uh, globally. Um, and I'll be around afterwards, so please come talk to me if you're interested. Thank you. One more speaker, just to squeeze in. Um, we've got Alistair from ZSL with the talk whose name I love, Hardware Best Payment. Thank you. I bet you've not seen Hardware Best Payment's talk before, but it is true. We've been talking about a project that I've been running with ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, and it's called Instant Wild. Has anyone seen it or heard it? Have you used it before? You can talk. So, ZSL has a mission to promote and achieve worldwide conservation of animals and habitats. It's a very general mission. We've been doing that for many a year now. And I started live back in um, 2007 at ZSL. And I was a volunteer web developer. And I volunteered for <coughs> six weeks, which then became six months, which then became a year. And eight years later, I'm still there. And that's how it kind of works in these uh, conservation communities. You often find that if the doors are open and your enthusiasm and not just your ability, but your desire to, to change and, and make the world a better place that they, that they strive to, to support you to do. And we came up with an idea back in 2011 called Instant Wild. And everyone was using what's called a camera trap. In the conservation community, essentially it's a camera strapped to a tree or a pole which identifies um, the movement of an animal by checking for the change in the heat, so a PIR sensor. And you would save this photo on an SD card, you'd go collect the SD card from the field and you'd use it for your conservation research. And they were becoming ever more popular, but there was a limitation, you still had to physically go and get that camera trap and get that SD card. And then there was the advent of a cellular camera trap. The cellular camera trap did a lot of things for the community. Because it enabled you to create, for example, a platform that could deliver the photos taken by the actual camera to any device on the planet. So it could be an app, it could be a website, it could be your local hard drive so you can check what's going on in the field using the biodiversity assessment. We thought, why don't we enable members of the public to identify these photos for us? So essentially the dream was there, that we could have tens of thousands of cameras clicking away in the field, photos sent to apps across the planet, and the public could identify these animals for us. Perfect idea, but it's, it takes a lot of work to get, to get done. I'll explain how I went about that now. But it could also promote and fuel discussion. And that's very similar to a rainforest live idea. If you can see the animals walking around in the wild and they're instantly transmitted to a phone, you're on a train, on uh, your daily commute to Waterloo, and right in front of you there's a jar of leopard going about its business in the middle of the night. And you're looking at it and you're identifying it and looking back at you. And that was something new that technology could provide. So we created an app, it's still only available on the iPhone. We haven't got around to doing the Android version yet, and we know we should. But we created an app, put some branding together, we called it Instant Wild. And we said it's going to help you monitor some of the rarest and most threatened species on the planet. And of course, we built a, a website for it too. Essentially, was, as you can see, we're still using the iPhone. But it was um, <laughs> trying to emphasize that you can get these photos on your mobile device, on your smartphone. And we set up several locations. We've got Sri Lanka, um, still got the United Kingdom, uh, Kenya, and we did have Mongolia, except it's too cold in Mongolia to even use a camera trap. It gets down to negative 33, uh, and our camera traps are freezing. I'll go on to how we tried to, to crack them. 
Uh, but essentially, it would let you whiz through the photos and you could identify what's in them. So you can see there's a green button that says, I want to identify what's in it, and a blue button that says there's nothing there. So another problem is these camera traps will misfire. Heat of the day will make them fire, the animal will be too fast walking by, or it'll just sometimes be too far away and out of the scene. So you had to make it an easy process. You can see this, I identify them. You whiz through a list of actual idents, so we provide you with a list of what we believe is in the area. You click on it, and we use that data and use it in our analytics to see what's going on. You can tell us things such as very rare animals have been spotted. You can tell us things such as um, predational animals has increased or decreased. And importantly, you can even tell you the poach has walked by or the criminal event has uh, happened. Here's a few more stats. Uh, 125,000 downloads. 1.5 million identifications, that's actual little clicks on, on the actual animals. And in Kenya we've noticed that the most prominent animal that the public like, of course, the elephants. Charismatic animals always do very well. Sri Lanka has been deers, but we've had some great um, surprises. We've had a Java leopard, we had a Sri Lankan leopard, and we had a mountain mouse deer. And this is this little chap here. So this guy showed up on the camera. He hadn't been seen in the wild, this actual uh, subspecies, for three years. He showed up on our camera and the public identified that, that for us, alerted us that it was on our list and we can check it out. It turned out to be called the mountain mouse deer. And about a week and a half ago, this guy turned up. This is a Sri Lankan leopard, 800 left in the wild. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning and I get the alerts on, um, on my system. And I can see all the, all the comments coming through saying, it's a leopard on the Sri Lankan camera. And I thought, that's not a leopard. I know that on that camera it's usually going to be a guinea fowl or a deer or a wild boar or a domestic dog. And it sounds weird, but it's true, you get a lot of domestic dogs on this camera because it's near civilization. And now I went to check it and I thought, oh, no, good is this a So um, that was instantly tweeted around saying, you have spotted a leopard. And even I was amazed because it's a beautiful experience to see such a, an endangered species walking, you know, literally through hiding with God. Um, and it was also nice for the community of someone someone before that you can, you can get that reality check that there isn't a wild space for, for wildlife where they can roam and live. This is right up to the border of, um, of where, where we approach. So what's next? Well, we have to increase the number of cameras. We have to continue our development. We need to both look at the R&D process, uh, process around it. We also have to protect our cameras. This photo is the last photo taken by this particular camera. No guesses uh, who destroyed it. So this is what happens to a lot of the cameras. We had to invite an invent a little icon, which is a picture of a hyena, because we lost so many. Uh, essentially, they chew through the LCD screens, and these are cameras we buy off the shelf, of course. And this has been our problem. Because how does it all work? Well, it works by using a humble camera trap with a cell antenna. That's how we've been doing it. So essentially, for normal um, SIM card in. It's got an LED flash, and you can see that over there. That's what actually illuminates the scene. You can get black flash too, so you can't see that red eye mark. Um, it's got a <coughs> camera on it, and it's GSM, so it's limited to where, of course, you've got cell, cell, cell phone coverage. And people have been making camera traps for a long time now. There's lots of cheap Chinese camera traps you can get. The cell kind of camera trap is quite new, so it's quite expensive, 250 pounds for a decent model. And essentially, they're all able to detect um, our mid heat change through the AR sensor, take about seconds to wake up, and they all use SD cards. But we had this problem that A, our cameras are getting destroyed, B, they're only limited to cell phone coverage, and C, we're 250 pounds a pop. So we had to get all of those now on price down, we had to get um, coverage, uh, we had to be able to put the cameras where we wanted to put them. We couldn't do that, we had to put them where the cell phone towers are. So we started to look at it. The IOI microphones started up in Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Digi. So you can see that the F5 presentation is perfect as ever So we can start working with this conservation community to actually build our own products. Now, all we wanted to do was get the photo for these guys. The guys sitting on the train, so they can identify the photo for us and help us with our stats. And the current cameras out there, these are some of the mates, uh, Scout Guard, Reconics, um, again, all limited and all still quite expensive. So we went out, we did buy Arduinos, we did start hacking around, seeing what we could do. Uh, I'm a technical advisor, so I do get a um, lucky day job for being able to play with these tools on my desk to come up with. Started exploring things such as um, XBs, ZigBees, um, looking at if we could use an Arduino and a, a load of shields to actually build our own camera traps. And you could, you could put a dongle on it and do 3G if you wanted to. Um, I've been working on a project where we're looking at an SD multiplexer. So essentially it's like a parasite that sticks on the SD card. Um, you may have seen Wi-Fi enabled SD cards. 
they're great, but you have to power the SD card. And on a camera trap, it literally shuts down and goes to sleep, wakes up, snaps the photo, and goes back to sleep. So there's no power to that SD card, so that it's not going to work. It's all right on a normal camera because you've got the power and it send the photo. So we had to make something which is basically a power site to power itself and nick all the content on that SD card and get it off. So you can stick a device on the back of the camera and then send it wirelessly away. Which comes into things like XP networks, mesh networks, where you can grab the data and get it out of the forest. But again, there's limitations in the real world. When I first started the project, I looked at the specs online, and it was like 24 kilometers line of sight, oh, that's fantastic. 24 kilometers right, just add all the dots and forest, yeah, we'll add all this, it'll be great. In reality, if you're in really the canopy, and you've got all the trees and all the reflection and it's wet, you're going to get more like 500 meters. So, you're not going to get 24. Even if you go to the top, in this diagram here, you go to the top of the trees and build it up there, you can do all right, you're still looking at 2 to 5k at best. Because you're not just sending a ping, you're trying to send a photograph. Even on a low res 20k photo, you still need a decent connection. But we progressed and we had a look at other alternatives too. Started playing with Raspberry Pis, not to actually take photos, but to aggregate and collect the data. And you can stick something like an Iridium satellite um, phone to it and go up, go to space instead of going through a forest, which would be quite advantageous. Um, and then we came to this proposition of, yeah, satellite is going to be our best bet. Let's connect a Raspberry Pi to a satellite modem. Now, before I started work at ZSL, I used to go off to Africa. I used to go on this truck with a whole load of volunteers in the mobile office, and we'd go to primate sanctuaries. It's called the Great Primate Handshake, and we'd park the truck outside, camp there for two weeks, and help them with their digital projects. So it'd be a digital fundraiser, could be a Kickstarter, but essentially we used to install this thing, which is a VSAP, and we used to build up the tire tracks, and it would give us satellite internet. Very useful doing things like Skype, so, well, satellite isn't great for Skype, but it, it did let us do it. And we used to do link ups and basically use that as a way to communicate in the middle of nowhere. And then things changed because ZSL got a £20,000 grant from Prince William and Kate, more people. They got married and they donated some their wedding fund to ZSL to help save the rhino. So we thought, great, this is a bit of cash that so we can build a satellite camera trap. So we went to Cambridge, we went to Cambridge Consultants, and they built a prototype camera trap. And then we thought, right, what wasn't working with us very well? How can we test this and really, you know, put it to, you know, put it to the testing ground? Or, or we could throw it to a pit full of hyenas and see how they like it. Or we could go back to that problem of the temperature. How are we going to fix it so it works in hot and dry and cold environments? So we took it to Antarctica. We strapped it to a boat and did time lapse photos. And then we set it up here. Obviously, this is a very nice setup. It's not cobalt or it's strapped to a tree. We used a big solar panel. But it started sending us photos like these. So these are live photos that get sent to us from that camera in Antarctica. We're monitoring with any penguins and we've built a satellite camera trap. We spent about 20 grand, uh, 20 grand on, on the process. Um, but we also started to combine science-based monitoring with law enforcement as well. Because satellite means you can put the camera trap where you want that. It wasn't just biodiversity, put it in areas where there are huge poaching problems. And then we made this, which is the Iridium Covert camera trap. So the ZSL camera trap, it's got an RF connection to a node which has an Iridium satellite modem in it. And we now use that to beam photos from anywhere on the planet to our servers. They're not live on Instagram yet, yeah, it's still in development. And the only reason we could build this is because we won a competition with Google Global Impact Award. We put our pitch out to the general public, they voted us in and we won an award. And we got a briefcase with half a million pounds in it. And that makes a big difference when you're trying to make camera traps like this. We also got advice from Google, so we now get to go over to their offices and hang out with their team. And it's basically revolutionised what we can do. So this is going to be our product, and we're going to be launching this in a few months' time in Kenya. We're going to put 100 cameras and 20 nodes. And now we're looking to do things like this, so CubeSats. It's great having a satellite network connection, but where can you go next? Well, why not try and get your own actual network in the sky, try and uh, use the basic, basically DIY community and all those great startups that are out there to essentially do this. Future's bright, it used to be Orange, it's probably Raspberry Pi or even Arduino. But what we want to try and do is innovate and use off-the-shelf technology and all of the kind of contacts like you guys out there, work with FFI, and everyone who's interested in cracking that problem how to actually 
get great conservation data, engage the public, and also use tech in innovative ways to solve the problem of uh, how we're going to actually conserve the planet. So that's me, Albert Davis, and that was into the world. We've got time for two questions. How big is the team working on this stuff? Uh, three people <laughs> in an office. Uh, it's often a common problem in the conservation community. The tech scene hasn't really kicked off yet. We know it is kicking off, but a lot of the investment is, is in kind of stereotypical fuel conservation um, biodiversity studies. And people love the idea of tech can solve the challenge, but Without big names like Google supporting you with that financial aid, it's difficult and you have to kind of step out there. I think that's why we need to create a scene. So create an actual conservation hub where I'm sure in the next five to ten years if we pushed it, people would realise this. It's, it's going to be huge. <coughs> Do your next. Um, I get, well, when you started talking, I was thinking you should talk to the in-house because they might fund you to do something. Why did you choose to work with the and how that work to Actually, a physical problem. So, in Marsat, it's geostationary. So, if you go to a reserve where you've got, say, the Black Rhino, it just so happens to be there's a huge hillside in your way, and you're placing your camera with the geo satellite up there, and you can't reach it. You have to then be clever about where you deploy it. We wanted a solution which was backpack deployable. So, the rangers themselves have these cameras, and they, they decide where to place them. So, you can't have a million cameras in, a, in Kenya, for example. Too big of an area, so that would be strategically placed. So, I wanted to get, literally get the backpack out, dip it open, put the camera down, turn it on, and it'll always get a connection. So, in my site, you have to actually think about it. The Viridian, because it actually flies over, you'll always get an angle as long as you can see the sky. That's all you've got to think about. You've just got to have the right side of the sky. So, I don't mean to be named because I think this is an absolutely amazing idea, but this is something I thought about before because where I'm from, um, there's a species of leopard that and it's recently made a comeback to the mountains uh, where I'm from. They've done a lot of um, photos, um, camera traps, and they and they're they're publicly available on on website um, with with the location of the farm to where it's possible. So what I'm wondering is, um, especially if the if it's publicly available and it might be geo you know, might be geotagged. <coughs> is that maybe people that you don't want to know, you don't want them to know where those animals are. You know, obviously it's our way by the, the way. But what is your what is your take on that? Yeah, it's a huge risk, and straight from the start, even even to this day, we realise that the satellite version of it is even more potent because it could be a great tool for conservation, but it could also be the most deadliest tool for poachers because you can literally get a live incident that takes sixty seconds to get to you photo of where there may be like the last rhino on the planet. So we have taken that to, to consideration. It's why we actually want to build our own cameras as well. So you can strip out those unfortunate issues such as a, a normal off-the-shelf camera trap accidentally geotagging your photo, for example. So, I mean, from a security perspective, the, the servers we use are in a nuclear bunker. So it's, it's in ash. You can go there and try and get it. There's lots of guys with guns. But um, it's in ash. It's, it's basically, from the ground up, a very high secure system. Um, encryption from the cameras themselves as well, so we can prevent things like that. We never publicly give the location out, so it'll be Kenya, and that's where the camera is, or Sri Lanka. When people say, oh, where's the camera? We never say, oh, it's at this, this location. And I think in the future we may even do some actual like, clever mixing where we don't give the location away in terms of even um, time of day. So we'll grab a photo from Sri Lanka, and it'll delay it by 20 minutes just to make sure that if you are waiting for it and you know where the camera is, don't actually get that 20 minute access to that. <coughs> but it is a massive issue and it has to be built into the system. Yeah. Do you think, just to follow on that, do you think that it, it's not really worth the risk of raising that, that awareness but having such detail of where the photos are? Because the ones I'm thinking of are of the leopards, it's specific farms in one, in one, in one mountain bowl, it's very easy to find. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting too because we actually split the process. We, we call it in the office public instant wild and private instant wild. So there are private systems running that aren't public, which are only for rangers from a certain area. And they've been specifically designated as private because of that issue. Because, especially with like governments, they don't want to reveal where these species are. 
and they want to keep it quite private. Even private game reserves only want it you know, for their own protection. So there will be instances where it just will never be public. The public versions here, we're pretty confident that they're well managed and we're literally running biodiversity studies. So when the leopard walk back, we now know in the area, great, this is great, there's a leopard still using the habitat, and we now know we can put some effort in to say we should keep watching this and it is of value. That's what we're looking for. You trap poachers just as quickly as you trap animals in the right place. Yeah, I mean, I'm even thinking of a scenario in the future with enough cameras, you could actually track a poacher at night. Because the new cameras are COVID as well, they have 3D printed tree bark over them, so that they look like a tree itself. So you could have someone on, the, on his phone in Shoreditch watching a poacher walk through a park. You could even see him kill an animal and walk back. You know, if you lied, but at least someone's reporting saying something's got to go on there. So it's a, it's a weird scenario, but it could happen. Thank you.